for this title. And he's got to go to the middle for and get something. And, and I'll tell you, honestly, I will love it if we beat them. Yes, everybody, welcome to another episode of The Warm Down today. Delighted to bring you European Cup winner, league winner, first black player to play for England, a legend in the game. Some career you've had, isn't it, Viv? Old. All right, old. <laughs> Viv Anderson, everybody. Thank you, Viv. How You're are welcome. you doing? You're welcome. Are you well? Yeah, good. Yeah, thanks. Me is a bit. Uh, got to get the wax out today. It's one of those bad day. Anyway. Um, right. I was, when we got here, I said I wanted to talk about Brian Clough and I wanted to talk about Sir Alex Ferguson, but there's something that you spoke about, uh, I think it was a couple of months ago, when you were talking about the lack of senior players, um, particularly at Manchester United, yep. um, and compared it to when you was there in 1989, when it was all going wrong for Fergie, and actually, one of the accolades that we didn't mention there, Fergie's first ever signing as manager of Manchester well, United. Well, myself and Brian McClure came together, so uh, but I win alphabetically. <laughs> so that's, Beautiful. That's, that's the way it works if anybody asks me, yeah. So when it was going a bit west under Fergie, yeah. uh, you mentioned senior players all got together after training one day um, and went and sat in the pub and sorted everything out. Yeah, yeah. we uh, we'd, uh, we'd just signed Gary Pallister. Uh, Mickey Phelan was there. We had a few senior players and uh, I think we got beat by Norwich on the Saturday. And uh, in the, back in the day, Bob would say we have a team meeting. So the team meeting was, you leave your cars at home, mm. uh, come to training, and we get a cab into town, and we have a bit of lunch, and we sort it all that out. So uh, we did, uh, and that after a few drinks, yeah, Bob says to me, we'll get Pally now. So we get Pally, sitting between us uh, in this pub, the other lads are on the other side, and uh, we said, uh, you're costing us games, you. He goes, don't agree with that. So we don't, not for debate, you're costing us games, you've got to get your finger out. Or words to that effect. Um, he took it on board, he wasn't happy at the time, he said, well, I don't agree with what you're saying, blah, 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 blah. But he took it on board that we were the senior players and uh, what we said was usually right. And uh, it turned out to be a really good player in the end. So it did work, you know, sometimes, you know, when things aren't going well, you know, manager can only do a certain bit. The coaches can only do a certain thing. I think it has to come from the players, and I think that's where we are at Manchester United at the moment. I think we haven't got enough senior players that people are going to listen to and uh, take on board what they've got to say and, and implement that on the football field. Yeah, I, I, that was another thing that I, I saw in that quote that you'd mentioned previously, that it seems like we've moved on, even the likes of Lukaku, Sanchez, Matic look like he's going... The, the experience has washed out of the team. It's an extremely young dressing room at the moment. And how it, much is it down to... I mean, how much can the manager actually do in these situations, do you think? And it's underestimated, you know. I went to Sheffield Wednesday from there and we had Nigel Pearson, me, Nigel Worthington, you know, people... And we had young lads like David Hurst, uh, Chris Woods in goal, Chrissy Waddle. So we had a lot of experience that knew what expected on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock, you know, or whenever you got to play. So we instilled that in the younger players. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And uh, as going back to your question, uh, the manager can only do a certain, a certain amount. Coaches can do a certain amount, but when things go wrong on the football field, I saw Dan Fletcher last night talking about sometimes the players on the field have to do it because mm. it's difficult. When the manager's shouting to you, you're going, I'm not bothered what he's got to say because I can't hear him anyway. You just go, yeah, 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 yeah. But on the field, you go, Brian Robson's a great example. You do that, you do that, you make sure you do that, you make sure you do that. And he can do that you know, face-to-face -face on a football field. And sometimes the players have to take responsibility and, and do that themselves. And I don't see enough of them doing that at Manchester United at this moment in time, which is really important, especially when you've got so many young kids, you know, Greenwoods and Rashford's now, what, 24? And he's captain the other night. 22. 22, captain, you know. He's got nowhere near ex much experience. But the other people around him, you know, the um, Linda Lovs and the goalkeeper, people like that. And uh, it does help that the people I've talked about are all English, you know. You've got a Spanish goalkeeper who, I don't know if he talks that much English, you know. And you've got the, a Swede at centre-back and all the different, you know. So it's, it, it's difficult, I know. But you've got to get as many, for me, you've got to get as many senior players. And a nice blend between senior players and uh, young players is the ideal 
mix, I think. I think I think Leicester's got a bit like that. You know, they've mm. got a few younger players, but you've got you've got uh, the centre back, you've got the goalkeeper. Didn't realise um, uh, the goalkeeper was 33, 34. You've got Vardy up front, just 34. Is Casper yeah. that old? 33, yeah. So yeah, so and you've got Vardy up front. You've got a, a bit of experience with a bit of youth in, involved, and I think ours is a lot of youth and not too much experience. What tangible benefits is there for experience on the football pitch? Because obviously you played with Brian Robson, who I think is most people's archetype of what a football captain's meant to be. What yeah. what sort of things is Robbo saying to you on the, or is he more of a lead by example, or is he? Um, he would say when when you get a ball off the goalkeeper and you're looking to play a ball into midfield and it's tight, he he'll be one of those who say you give it me. If I lose it, it's down to me. But you give it me, so you gives you the confidence to go and play balls that you wouldn't normally play you'd probably go oh I won't play that one I'll play that one there because it's easier ball for me to play and it's not as risky and all the rest of it that's what experienced players do Matic, yeah Matic, Matic does that to a certain degree you know he's had his he's had his fallouts he's come back in the team and when he's come back in the second half especially yesterday yeah, yeah. I, I thought he did excellent he took the ball taking the ball in areas where younger players would go oh it's a bit tight in there I'm not so sure about that and that's where, you know, the Glen Oddles, where I played with Glen Oddle. Glen Oddle was, you, if, if it was really tight, he'd say, give it me, give it me, give it me, because I'm confident in my own ability. And if you give it him three times, you lose it three times, you're not going to do it the fourth time. But you give it him three times and he goes, does what he says he's going to do. You take that on board and you give it him more often and you, he's more creative than you'll ever be. So um, I think that's why experienced players are really, really needed, especially at growing, emerging football clubs. You know, it's really important for me. Right, you've played under two of the greatest managers that I've ever walked up and down a touchline. Yeah. Uh, I think that's fair to say. <laughs> well, if you come from Nottingham, yeah, I would have thought so, yeah. Um, what was the difference and what was the similarities between uh, Brian Clough and Sir Alex? Uh, what's the difference? They're very, very similar in many respects. I must have been asked this, and I've just had a pound every time I've asked this question, been asked this question. Um, what I'd say, they're very similar in many respects. They, they demand respect from the players and they get respect from the players. They play football in the same way. You know, they play and move um, and you be creative as much as you can, give you a licence to do what you want, but you, you've got to entertain, which is great. And people say to me, who would you choose between the two? And I go, it's a really difficult decision, that, because so what Sir Alex has done for 37, oh, 27 years or however long he was at Man United for is will never be beat. I just go back to Cluffy. We, we used to train, uh, we used to go down the training field and we used to have to get the cows off the training field. That's how primitive it was. So to, to get a club like Nottingham Forest, remember it's only for five years, Fergus done it for 27 years, um, to, get, to get them to win back-to-back -back European Cups has got to be an unbelievable task. And to get the players together, which he did with him and Peter Taylor, I'd just say, if I had to choose, I'd say Brian Clough by just a gnat. Uh, but if Mr. F if Sir Alex is watching, I'd say him. <laughs> <laughs> um, from what I've seen, yeah, the, it, it shone extremely bright and then it looked like that team got picked apart a little bit, unfortunately. But winning back-to-back -back European Cups, yeah. winning back-to-back -back league titles. Yeah. And it was from a, a pretty unfancied team at the time. It wasn't like Nottingham yeah. Forest had traditionally done that. No, I average mean, crowd of 19,000. Wow. You know, so, you know, it's a... What they did, what we did at that time, is it will not be surpassed. And remember, everybody seemed to forget about that. Prior to Arsenal's um, Invincibles, we had the record to, over two seasons. We were half for one season and half for another season undefeated. So uh, Arsenal just beat our record, I don't know how many years ago it was, but we thought at the time that would never be beaten. Now, Arsenal's record is still living today, and you've still got Liverpool around the corner, as we speak today, could beat that or equal it or better it. We hope it doesn't happen, obviously, being, oh. being Reds, but, you know, there is a possibility. There is a legit possibility. The yeah. fact that we're the only team that's taken points off of the, off them this season is kind of terrifying, isn't it? And oh, it not, is, yeah. They've not even been as good, I don't think, as it was last season. And, and they lost once last year and lost a league. So, you know, it's interesting, <laughs> it's interesting times for everybody connected, I would have thought. Uh, European Cup in the late 70s yeah. uh, and making your England debut at around about the same time. Yeah. Um, what sort of cultural impact do you think that did with you being the first black player? Because um, I can't imagine there's many black players players across Europe full stop? Well, there wasn't money at the time. There was a bit of debate between myself and Laurie, who was going to be the first black player to play. Uh, uh, God rest his soul, he was the first under-21 under black international. 
And there was always debate whether it's going to be me. And we shared a room together in one of the England games. I think it was Sophia away, uh, playing Bulgaria. And uh, uh, he's saying, what do you think? I says, if it's you, if it's you, if it's me, it's me. It was never really, a, well, it's got to be me, it's got to be you. It's, it was just friendly, a bit of banter. We were looking at car magazines more than anything else. <laughs> But um, luckily enough, it was me, and uh, obviously it was a big thing at the time. And you know, even now, you know, it gets brought up all the time. If I go to London, people will say hello. So yes, I'm very privileged and proud to be the first black player, full international. And uh, yeah, it was a big thing at the time. And uh, moving on now, it's you look at the England side, all the English setup. There's lots of black faces, which is great. Yeah, I think it represents the society that we're in. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. To 2020, yeah, it uh, it does replicate. You know, there must be at least seven or eight, nine black faces in that, you know, when there was only myself, Laurie, and then Cyril came along. Um, there wasn't many after that. Do you think prior to <clears> you um, <throat> breaking through and becoming the first black player, there was any sort of prejudice in team selection? Or do you think it was just more of a case? Of... I, would, I would hope not. Having worked with um, Bobby Robson and Ron Greenwood before, and um, who were my managers at the time, they were football men, you know, so if you had the ability, it's like Cluffy, if you had, if you had the ability, um, no matter what colour your skin was, you were playing. I always remember going to, uh, we played Newcastle away, it was one of my second or third game, and uh, went out on the pitch and got so much abuse, I came back in, this is before the game, I go back in, I say, oh, Mr Cluffy, I don't think I can play today, he goes, you're playing, end of. So I go, well, I've got no choice then really, <laughs> so I had to go out and play, you know, so... And luckily enough, I had a manager at that time, else we wouldn't have this conversation. I'd be, I'd be working in Sainsbury's or somewhere like that. So luckily enough, I was around, he was around at the time and gave me the, the guidance too. And he, put, and he said afterwards, he says, I think we got beat in the game anyway, because it was two at McDonald, you know, there was a, 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 a very, very uh, emotional place to go and play. And uh, very, the supporters were very, very, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, euphoric in the Newcastle area so uh, to go there we got beat he, but he pulls me afterwards and says you did okay tonight he said uh, but if you're going to let people like these who you, you were playing against not sort of players but the supporters dictate to you you're never going to make a career so I went <laughs> I want to be a footballer so I took that on board and it never really never really bothered me after that um, that well, literally was going to be my next question yeah. is, does it get through or are you able to brush it off? It depends if you go and play uh, Tranmere on a, on a cold, wet Wednesday night when there's only 2,000 people, you'll hear all the comments. But when you're playing in front of 60, 70, 50 or 1,000, you know, it's very difficult to hear individual comments unless it's a collective. And it doesn't really happen that often. But it's one of those where... It's one of those you just got to get on with it. I mean, I played in the area where you had to get on with it. There's no alternative. You get on with it and you play and, and play to your best of ability. And hopefully you get picked next week for the manager and you did well for the manager, you did well for the football club. And there was no issue about walking off fields and uh, getting upset because what they're saying or shouting or whatever it may be. It was an area where you had to get on with it. And uh, if you didn't get on with it, you wouldn't make a career. Do you think that the racism with players are, and certainly prejudice in selection was eradicated on the basis of like, you can look at one player and you can look at another player and you go, well, he's better, I'm just going to play him. But do you think it exists as it apparently exists with managers because we don't actually know how to rank the ability of a manager as much as we know how to rank the ability of a player? I remember when you talk about that great Forest team, I think we only used 15 players all season. You know, so it was, you'd play and play until the manager thought, I could do with this now, he'd take you out, you know. So he, he, it, was, it was one of, you didn't have a, a squad of 26 where you could choose from mm. and, and uh, rest or, you know, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, it was a matter of 15 players for, he thinks, the best 11 plays most weeks uh, until they got tired and you could see them physically tired. And then you pick one of the squad players in. So it's a completely different thought process as a manager then as is now. Do you think um, football's better or worse for, for the massive squads and squad rotation? Do you think the starting 11, just consistent 11 until someone was injured, was a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I'm going to say it's, it was a good thing. I, mean, I always remember myself and Tony Woodcock playing for England at the end of the season and I think we played 70-odd games. Then we played, we played Sweden away uh, in, a, in a friendly it was in Sweden 
um, at the end of the season, and we both played for we played for England on the day. We both got in the battle like that. I just can't move. I can't even talk. I can't even do anything. So um, it's one of those we're just used to getting on with playing week in week out. We didn't train to a great deal because we were playing games all the time. So. And, you, and the only time you're ever judged is when you're playing games, not when you're in training and how good you are in training. It's about playing football matches and winning football matches. That's why that successful Forest team, the Sunday Invincibles, match the Invincibles. We, we used to come in, we'd come in the Monday morning and go, uh, the coach would say, what do you want to do today? We'd say, well, we'll have a five-a-side. they go, all right, then, do what you want. And we did that week in, week out, day in, day out, because they knew, the management team knew, on a Saturday afternoon or on a Wednesday or on a Thursday or whenever we had to play, they knew what they would get out of us. If, we did, if they didn't know what they were going to get out of us, we'd be doing set drills, we'd be doing this, that, the other. We never worked on a set piece, ever, Forrest, never. It was one of those, you're good enough to play, you play, and that's it. So it's a completely different world to what we're talking about now. Right. I had Alex Stepney on uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and we were talking about both training and tactics. Right. And he told me, um, so Matt Busby's tactics ahead of the 68 Cup final what, uh, it consisted of this. Nobby, you're Mark and Eusebio. Uh, and that was it. Yeah. And you're like, wait, wait what? Because yeah. like, that's the equivalent of Cristiano Ronaldo at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, World yeah. player of the year, yeah, yeah, absolute yeah. phenom. Yeah. And he, just and he knew Nobby would do a job on him. And he told him in a tunnel. <laughs> he told him in a tunnel as he was waiting to walk out, oh, by the way, you're Mark and Eusebio. And you're like... What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I hear yourself talking about, oh yeah, we just played five a side. And yeah. you're just like, how do you win back to back European Cups and back to back titles? And it, it sounds less organised than anyone's school team. I, I, I tell you a great story. European Cup final in Madrid, first one. It's the first one? Anyway. Not many people can say the first. Well, anyway, final yeah. Hey, right, game. right. So we go to. <laughs> say, you know, games on the, uh, say the games on the Wednesday. We get there on the Monday, training ground outside Madrid. We get the training ground, and uh, first training session, no balls. Uh, <laughs> no balls. He said, there's a dartboard, chess, dominoes. Is, no this, a, is this a cluffy thing? Yeah, no, right. no footballs. Deliberate. 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 So get to, get to, Wednesday, the day of the game, we've not touched a football since a Saturday. And Peter Shilton was adamant, he's got to touch a football, he's got to feel the football. So he says, for you, young man, I'll make an exception. So he got him a, a couple of balls from where? Maybe the village next door, don't know where, with the coach. And I remember my mate, I saw him afterwards, there wasn't mobile phones in them days. They saw Peter Shilton on an island so he went out, got the, the coach went out, got the boulders off this island and a piece of grass and knocking balls at Peter Shilton. So there's my mates going around the island with his mates going to the game. And he sees Peter Shilton going like this, <laughs> going, like this going like this. And he only tells me afterwards because, as I said, no more fire, no more phones. But that was the case. He was the only one that touched a ball in that European Cup for him. He was one of those, you go out and play and that's it. So was that trying to get you to relax, do you think? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. It, it backfired. Uh, because we played Wolves in the, uh, we're going to Cluffy stories again. We played Wolves in the uh, Milk Cup final. I'm all about where, that where Andy Gray uh, knock, uh, knocks down Peter Shilton or clashes with Peter Shilton. The ball bops down. He knocks in the net. One 0 We get beat by Wolves. Uh, the night before, we've gone to bed. Archie Gemmell and all the senior players. Everybody's gone to bed, and uh, we had a room at the Royal Lancaster, and um, the manager says. Uh, to the coach, Jimmy Gordon, get everybody down. This is half past nine at night. Most of them got to bed. We get a phone call. Uh, manager wants everybody down in the room. We, we had a private room, uh, so we had dinner. Uh, and we're going, why? He says, oh, the manager wants everybody down. So everybody comes down. Like, oh, Archie Kemmel goes, what are we doing here? So we come down, sit, sit around the tables. Next thing, the door opens. There's a crate of champagne. There's a crate of orange juice. Comes in. It's going off here. He goes, nobody leaves this room till they tell me a joke. <laughs> so we had to individually tell a joke. And if he liked it, you could go to bed. I got to bed at 12 o'clock and woke up against Wolves with a bit of a fizzy head, thinking, I've got to play a cup final here today, you know. And we get beat 1-0. So it didn't always work, but it was his way of relaxing. Um, have a glass of champagne and tell a joke and, you know, be, don't think about what's happening tomorrow. 
remember any of his team talks prior to the finals? Finals, no. I always remember, he'd always come in late and he'd get the football up. Not always do this, but he'd go, he'd get the football, you, and go, you, give it to him because he can play better than you. <laughs> Simple. Just and they'd walk out. Pass. They'd walk out. That was it? That was it. You play the ball, give the ball to people who can play, and then walk out. You wouldn't see him all week, and that's, that's all he'd say. But um, he, he earned his money on the, on the coaching side. Who to take off, who to, who to cajole, who to... You know, he'd, he'd be one of those. He'd earn his money then. He's not, he wasn't one for, for training and all that. He'd leave other people to do all that. Do you think that Nottingham Forest side gets brushed over? Because football was in a dark age, but probably on and off the pitch, really. It was, it's not quite the golden era of the 60s with your World Cup and United winning European Cups and stuff. Yeah. And it wasn't quite the Premier League era, which is all blasted all over every TV yeah, station. Yeah. Those late 70s and mid 80s just seems to just... You just look at that Liverpool be... team as a great team, you know. You know, we beat them in the first but round. We get them in the first round. Them, they? No, and they never talked about it, no. You look at the Terry McDermott's and the Kevin Keegan's and all the, the great players, Phil Neal's and all them, you know, some fantastic... Alan Anson, all them. Uh, fantastic players, I agree. Um, maybe it was a bit washed over, but you, you go to this, these areas, you go to Liverpool, they still talk about... Oh, they talk about all the Dalglish and Rush and all the rest of them. And, and Nottingham now, we go back, and now it's like 40-odd years since, and we go back and we did a, a, something at the ground the other week. There was that thousands of people there you know so we all remembered in those where we where we did our stuff in the first place but as I say I go down to London from time to time and people always mention the Forest team and things like that so it's good did you think Sir Alex was going to get it right when you was at United was there anything uh, that you the, had certainty of the only reason I ever went is because of his passion and I knew that he would get it right yeah uh, I came to Man United as a schoolboy, obviously and, and uh, they said I was going to make it at Man United so I went back Got a job for about five weeks, and then got a and then thought what, he said come and play for. Job? I was a silk screen printer, which <laughs> which means I was a glorified tea boy. Used to get a tea at, at lunchtime and sandwiches and stuff like that. I was a runner really, and then um, and then thought he said come and play for our youth team. Play for the youth team twice. Uh, got uh, uh, permission off of work to go and play in the youth team twice, <laughs> and then Man United. Uh, uh, Man United said oh, we'll, we'll sign you, so I became apprentice. Uh, if I said I'll sign you, become a pentis then. And uh, I'm from there, really. Brilliant. Um, what do you think Oli needs to do currently? Or do you think he's capable of doing? And, it, and there's a lot of work. I, I, I understand where he's coming from with the younger lads and, you know, and nurturing the, the young lads as much as you can. You know, Greenwood's been a, bit, been a success. I think Rashford's playing really well now. You know, so I think the left back's really good, uh, Williams. So um, he just needs a bit more experience, I think. And, and I think... In this transfer, when it's very, very difficult to get the players you want, because the big clubs don't want to sell the good players, so the only way the only way you're going to get better players that's going to better benefit the football club is in the summer, unless you're going to go to a Leicester and offer silly money for the likes of Madisons, and, mm. which I've been rumoured to see to hear about. So, and, and if I was Leicester, there's no way you're getting Madison in this transfer window. Yep. Uh, you're going to have to wait to the summer if he's available. I wouldn't make him available because he's one of the the young ones, it's going to do really well for them. So yeah. it's very difficult uh, to pick and choose, you know, um, where you're going to get where you're going to get better players in this transfer window. Because notoriously, this uh, Christmas chan- or this January transfer window is always difficult to get players. Do you think it's a case of simply needing better players, or do you think there's more Oli could be doing coaching wise as well? Um, well, he can only do. He can see the players and watch the players, you know, and say you've got to put them in. Because, you know, they're better than what we've got. And some of the younger lads are, you know. It's a fine balance, you know. It's a fine balance, you know, with experience. And, you know, you look at... I didn't realise Martial's only 24. He's the youngest ever uh, teenager. uh, Most expensive youngest teenager. At 19, 30-odd million. I didn't realise. He seemed to have been around for a long while, you know. You know, and you've got Jesse. How old is Jesse now? 27. 27. You've got Marcus, really youngish. You've got the left back, really young. You've got Jones, who's really young. You've got midfield players. Jo- you, Jones ain't that young no more. He's been here 10 years. Yeah, not that Jones, the other Jones. I'm talking about, sorry, I meant the uh, right winger. What's the right winger called? Come from oh, one James. Swing. James, sorry. I meant him. Yeah. A lot of young players. Yeah, Wamasaka, in, young lad as well. Yeah, there's a lot of young players in that team and they need a bit of guidance. You know, I went from 
Man United to Sheffield Wednesday because of, because of Ron Atkinson knew I'd been experienced, I'd been experienced, been around, and I knew, and he knew he had some younger lads that was half decent, like the David Urs of these worlds, that, you know, that need a bit of guidance and a bit of what's right, what's wrong, and things like that. And I don't think Man United has got enough of them. Yeah, I think. When you hear the stories of um, when Memphis was at the club, uh, turning up in a Bentley dressed like a fucking matador, yeah. and Rooney ripped strips off him, yeah, 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 and you go, okay, if someone turned up dressed like a matador today in an orange Bentley, nobody blank an eye, blank an eyelid, yeah. Who, imagine, what, imagine that under Roy. Imagine oh. that under Brian Robson. You just wouldn't get away you with stuff. You never played with Roy, did you? No, I never played with Roy. No, no, totally dumped yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I know Roy really well. Cause you played with Forest and. We met with half the pass of course. We, we all live around there anyway, so I've seen from time to time. You just wouldn't get away with stuff like that, you know. You know that's where the manager, the manager has no say in it. You know, the captain would say, "Hey, you, you see you in that car again, you know, you, you get the rough of everybody." Seriously, that's that's that's, that's, how, that's how, yeah, that's right, yeah. It used to happen all the time. All the time. Someone turns don't, be coming that, don't, be, hey, don't be coming that again. <laughs> One of those, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and they take it on board because you, you were the captain, you're the senior player, you listen to what they've got to say. Madness. Yeah. On that note, Viv, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what Play On Pro is? Play On Pro is about uh, uh, ex players, not. They're not just footballers, but we've got golfers, cricketers, you know, tennis players. We've got badminton players, men and women. I like a girl called Gail Ems. You know, we're trying to look after them post retirement. Really, we're trying to get them work. We've got an app for them where we uh, we create uh, opportunities for them. They can speak to one another. It's invitation only. No disrespect to uh, people who've played at Rochdale, but we we've talked about you've got to play in the Premiership or Championship, uh, first class cricket, obviously, and things like that. So we've got. Uh, over 500 now, uh, ambassadors we call them, and uh, we try to keep them, you know, when, when, you, uh, when you finish, you wait for the phone to ring, the phone never rings, you go, what do I do? You know, we're trying to help them on that path to the next phase of their lives, really, and uh, we've been going about three years now, and hopefully they, they gain some stuff from it, hopefully. Brilliant, there's some right names on it. Yeah, 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 they are. Um, and so actually... But it, it, not all finished as well, actually. No, no, we've got Winks, we've got Grealish, we've got people like that who's oh. still playing, yeah. Yeah, that's on our app, yeah. So we're, we're able to grow the ambassadors. We're, as I say, we're over 500. We're trying to get that to 1,000 this time next year. So uh, we're growing and uh, we're trying to get them work, you know. Chris Gale there, so he's a good lad. So, you know, um, we're trying to get them work and give them some sort of purpose in life if they want to go on courses and stuff like that. We're trying to help them in that respect. So in all aspects of their life, we're trying to help them and uh, give them some. So there's a great example. There's a lad called um, Steve Hodge and um, uh, Kevin Gallon. They played together at QPR mm. over 20 odd years ago. They both came on the app very similar time. They hadn't spoke to each other for 20 odd years. Right. So the text one of the hands, but you know, so it's getting that camaraderie back, getting that uh, synergy back that he had all those years ago and speaking to mates he never spoke to for years. He went, once you finish, it's one of those. How many, one was in the other day, one of the play ex players, how many ex colleagues have you got on your phone? He went through, he went four. You know, they, they lose track, they move clubs, they get new friends and they never, never stick with anybody. So this is, this is a place where they can come and speak to one another, hopefully get them work. And uh, we do tours, we, we took them away to Hong Kong for the last three years, we picked a team. Uh, we didn't do particularly well, but we, but the uh, opportunity to go and play and do things they did all those years ago. Nice, brilliant. Yeah. Um, right, this is brought to you guys by the Athletic, which is a new home of football writing. They've got an outrageous team, especially on United as well. If you're interested in checking out, you get a month's free trial and 50% off all of your stuff. Link is in the description, and it's theathletic.co.uk forward slash Housen if you're into it. I'll throw a link to this in the description as well in case you want to come and check out what Play On Pro are up to. But like I said, thank you very much, Vib. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.